Check it out, I got a new camera. This is gonna be rad. I can move the sucker around wherever I want. It auto focuses. Look at that. Look how close I can get. I can be like, hey, look at this detail. And you'll be like, hey, I can see that detail. And then I'll put it on the table. And the camera will be like, Hey, that thing's on the table. I think I'm going to focus on that now. Pretty cool. Hey, Nasir. Hey, Diaflop little sounds. How's it going? Welcome. The thing I like most about this camera and this little rig that I got for it is uh, I can just I can move it with one hand. This is going to be awesome working on painting this thing right now. Kind of painting. So this is um, semi-fresh out of the mold. This cast. Let me show you what it looks like when it's all put together. Here is the cast where you can see all of the parts put together and painted. I still want to do probably a wash on this to bring out some of the detail more. Deal of vocal full sounds? I nailed it? Awesome. Yeah, that's a, it's pretty easy to pronounce name. Very intuitive. Flows off the tongue. D-flow. Oh, D-flow sounds. Okay. I always appreciate help in pronouncing names because most of the time I have no idea. Enrique from Peru, eh? Awesome. Someday I'd like to go to Peru, but today is not that day. I'm too busy doing this. I'm sculpting. I'm painting. I'm painting a sculpture. So I don't know if any of you uh, came on here in a confused state because I originally uh, started a an event, quote unquote. So YouTube's streaming options have stream live and create event. And so I intuitively intuited that creating an event is basically like broadcasting out to people, hey, at this point in the future, a live stream is going to happen. Well, 20 minutes ago, I sat down to try to figure out how does it actually start? Like, how does it know to do the thing? And I started looking into it. It turns out it's Google Hangout, which is some weird thing that Google Plus used to have, and then Google migrated it over to YouTube. So it was some weird shenanigan thing. I had no idea what was going on. So long story short, I canceled that, and instead I'm just live streaming. But my point is uh, I'm trying to make this be my regular live stream night, uh, Wednesday nights at around 7.30 or 8 whenever I get home from work and get the computer set up and stuff. Um, and then I'll probably, I'll probably do some occasional ones on the weekend, like earlier in the day, so I can try to get people on the other hemisphere, other side of the world. You're from Cajamarca City. I'll bet I pronounced that perfectly. Uh, Nasir is asking, is this silicone? No, this is a resin. This is a resin called uh, Smoothcast 326. So it's a color match liquid, which means it's pretty translucent. It's almost transparent. The... Um, I put uh, baby powder in the mold as a release agent, so it's pretty cloudy as a result of that. But um, it 
doesn't need to be that cloudy. I'm doing, I did a couple of these translucent ones. I got a couple different ideas for what I want to do with them. For this one, I want to mount it on this old hunk of wood I've had sitting around forever. I'll show it to you. And with the power of my awesome camera, you can actually see the whole thing, more or less. Let's take a journey over it, shall we? Yeah, so anyway, I want to put like... Um, Because it has this has this really crappy, weird resin coating over it that's all like cracked and busted up. But I think it works with the nature of the sculpture. So I'm going to basically like glue this down and then like have make it look like basically it's amber or sap or something that's oozing out of it. We'll see. Experimenting. But, um, before I mount it, I want to paint it in such a way that I can pull out the details on it. Because, you know, as you can see on this piece, there's a lot of details in there that kind of get lost in the glossy shine. So I'm going to see if I can do the best of both worlds where... Um, it's you, you see the translucency and the amber of you know effect through it but you can also see the details so for that i'm going to use a shade or a wash which is kind of like a watered down paint that just gets into the little crevices hey onassis drones the toy tracker how am i how are you i'm doing all right i'm pretty i'm I'm a little uh, loopy. I was up very late last night, unable to sleep. You know, and you get those creative brainstorms and you just think about all the projects that you're working on. Um, yeah, that's what I was doing till all hours of the morning. Uh, and as Sue says, the piece of wood looks so smooth. Yeah, so this was basically you know, on a big industrial bandsaw, they hacked it down and then they coated it with a super thick layer of some kind of resin or polymer of some sort. And uh, I think I got it at a garage sale or a, a secondhand store. I believe it was a clock originally. You kind of make out some things there. I don't know, but it's just kind of old crappy busted up thing and... I've always wanted to use it for something, and this seemed like the per perfect opportunity. Onassis Drone, you are good. I'm glad you're good. You know, the world can use as many good people as it can get. I'm going to put on gloves. Because I don't like stuff on my hands. Nadina says, I love the Demon Hunter logo. I was hoping that's what it meant. Yep. It is not the Demon Hunter anime. It is not the Demon Hunter uh, Diablo 3 character. It is the Demon Hunter from the band Demon Hunter. Here's mm -hmm. showing you the original artwork. This is the album cover for the album called The Triptych. Actually, there were three different covers, and then this is like a fourth special cover that uh, combines all the elements from the other three. So, yep. I really loved that design and thought it needed to be a sculpture, so I sculpted it. Hey, Cassie. I'm glad you think it's awesome. Uh, and Onassis think it's going to be awesome. Wow, okay. 
there's a there's a lot of positive um, vibes behind it. Let's see how it turns out. So I have these two quick shades. I have a strong tone and a soft tone. So I'm going to start with the soft and see what happens. Nasir asks, so why make a new mask and not fix the painting on the one you already have? Uh, I'm going to be doing both. I, I cast it so that I could make as many as I wanted and do as many different takes on it as I felt like doing. It's one of those pieces that lends itself to a lot of different directions. It could be rusty metal, it could be like wood, it could be, you know, in this case I'm doing kind of a weird sappy thing. Um, I think it would also look pretty cool if it was like matte black. Not sure. Just gonna just gonna play with it and see. Alrighty. Uh, I think I'm gonna start. Oh, hold on. Can't quite start yet. I still have from the uh, casting process. Not all of the little holes were uh, popped out yet. That's right, Nasir. Many, many variations on the same theme is the idea. I enjoy exploring variations on themes. This, uh, this rusty one, I wanted to mount it on like a, like a barrel head, like a, the lid of an old barrel. And so I was looking around for where to get one of those. And there's, there's lots of them around for fairly cheap, but they're all like a hundred plus miles away. Or they'll ship them to you for like $35. And so I'd end up paying fifty dollars to mount this thing. It's not quite, not quite at the point where I feel like it, that's worth it. I called around. There's a bunch of wineries near me in this town called Woodenville, and none of them that actually talked to me said they had any. Some of them sell barrels, but not just the head. And I'm not interested in having a giant barrel hanging around. My studio is cluttered enough already. Brad says, hey, sir, Josh of House Foreman, sculptor of all things, breath of life, haver of fine t-shirts. That's if sure. That's a good description. <clears throat> Are you a uh, a bard? You should you should accompany heroes on their journeys and sing about how awesome they are. This T-shirt here, I got printed at um, on my Threadless site where I I put several of my designs up there. This is not my design. This is from the game Rogue Legacy, and I was looking for a Rogue Legacy shirt because I loved the game, and there none existed. So I was like, "Well, great." So I went to the artist's website that did the pixel art for it, and he has all his super res, super high res. Oh, well, are they high res? I don't know. He's got all his pixel art there, and so I just snagged one to make myself a shirt. I would never sell it because it's not my IP. But I did want to advertise their game for them because it's an awesome game. Mm. 
This here is asking, uh, so you're going to glue the mask parts together first, then on the wood, or just glue them to the wood separately? Uh, I'm going to glue them all together to make sure they're fit just right. Yeah, probably. Actually, now that you bring it up, that's an interesting idea, because I guess I'll do whatever makes it lay the flattest, because I'm not sure it's going to be super flat if once it's all together... You know, I designed it to lock together pretty tight, but the casting and molding did not go as smoothly as I hoped. So it's not a super precise, uh, perfect piece. Let me try real quick now. Hmm. Yeah, it might actually lay flatter if I glue them down all separately. This is just... I think I just need to sand that down. It's making it pop up from the surface too much. Anyway, thanks for prompting me to think about that mess here. Oh, uh, NASA says, see if you can buy it at a Cracker Barrel restaurant. You know, I wouldn't be surprised, and I'll bet they are probably $120 at a Cracker Barrel restaurant. Like, anything you buy for interior design, you know, like furniture and stuff, it's going to be marked way up. Like, I just want a rotting old hunk of wood. Um, like, the older and rottier, the better. And, uh, like, I, I know there's thousands of those laying around in people's yards and farms and stuff. I just, uh, I, I don't know who those people are or how to get them to give them to me. Okay. Now let's try to do this painting. Bracknar, we ate Brad and there was much rejoicing. Yeah, if, uh, if he sings too much, that can happen. Much rejoicing in the village. Yay. Onassis says, can you sell what you're making now? I mean, I could. I could totally get away with it. Um, I, I wouldn't. I just, um, I don't want to make money off of other people's IP. I respect the process of creating intellectual property and maintaining it and all that stuff too much to just take it and run with it. I, I have talked to Ryan, the uh, singer and founder of uh, Demon Hunter. About, you know, I run into him at shows. He's local. He lives in Seattle. And uh, so I run into him from time to time. And I gave him one of my sculptures, and he liked it. Um, but then uh, the email that I have for him doesn't work anymore. And he's got his own business, this really cool design firm called Invisible Creature, I think. Um, so yeah, he's just a super busy guy, and I lost contact with him. So if any of you out there know him or know someone at his label and are like, hey... They should talk to Josh about uh, selling these through their websites or whatever. Then tell them. So this stuff... I, I sprayed a clear coat over the surface of it to make it extra shiny. And that may fight what I'm trying to do with this shade. We'll see. Oh, another hole I missed. Brett. Uh-oh.
boy. Man. I'm not doing good at catching on my little holes. Hey Amy, you're late, that's all right. One tardiness is acceptable, just don't let it happen again. Actually, I think you weren't at the last live stream either, so you may have to go on probation, young lady. Nasir is asking, I uh, wanted to ask about the action figures industry. How can they produce huge amount of figures with the same sculpting and same painting? Um, I've never worked in the action figure industry. I, I know some people who do, but I don't know that they would have a ton of insight either. I mean, it's all done in China. Well, yeah, you know what? They would have to know about that stuff in order to make sure that they're sculpting and, and stuff according to the specifications that the factories have. But um, a lot of it is, is done by machines now, and a lot of it is done by just, you know, a row of people on an assembly line where one guy does the boots and another one dry brushes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Amy says, oh no, I missed them because I keep getting on YouTube right after the stream ends. Oh, wow. Okay, well, hopefully this won't be a problem for you because uh, I'm going to be doing a regular schedule for the foreseeable future. I'll be doing every Wednesday night between 7.30 and 8 is when I'll start it. And I'll shoot for around an hour. Sometimes go more, sometimes go less, I'm guessing. And then I'll do wild cards every once in a while on the weekends. I said this earlier, I, wanna, I want to be able to hit the people in Europe and Africa and the Middle East and Asia and all those areas that, um, you know, this time of day for me is, you know, the middle of the night for them. So, so on weekends, I'll try to do like a, a noon my time, which seems to hit more... Um, more availability over on that side of the planet. So it looks like you know, I've been kind of toying around with this a little bit with this this little wimpy brush just to get a sense for how I want to apply this. It looks like just slathering it on is the way to go. So I can graduate to a much bigger brush here. Because I'm putting it on and I'm still definitely seeing the translucency. Like if you look around the edge there, you can see the red brush going through there. So that's pretty cool. That that's what I like about this for a base is it has so much pattern on it you'll be able to definitely see that pattern through the sculpture to a certain degree to you know maximize the point of it being translucent I'm so excited to uh, have this new webcam that will not shut off every half hour. It makes this so much less stressful. You can just kind of 
going to have fun doing art. Somebody tell me about a project they're working on. Hey, Aiden. What kind of stuff are you guys making? definitely make out the details better now I might I think I'm gonna go over this with a with the darker one after this coat dries okay big brush Aiden says there's a bunch of skeletons dancing and playing trumpets. What? Oh, oh, I missed your last one. You're doing a 3D animation in Blender. Oh, cool. Are you doing it for Halloween? I tried Blender once. I'm, I'm so used to the to Maya and Max that I just was completely lost and confused the whole time got frustrated and gave up Amy says I'm decorating my room by making a long finger knit thing and hanging it over my window I'm painting after this as well painting your room as well So you're making like a like a window, for like a knit window frame decoration thing. There's probably a word for that. I always wanted to decorate my room and make it look like a like a castle dungeon or you know something weird. Like a sci-fi spaceship. I don't know. Just, just an excuse to put props all over the walls and stuff. Turns out if you seriously pursue that, you're uh, going to spend a lot, a lot, a lot of money. I don't actually want this on the inside because the inside has all these other convoluted shapes and since it's translucent they they kind of fight with the surface that you see Nasir is making a DIY raised staff from Star Wars for cosplay. Awesome. That's a cool staff. Are you uh, building it from scratch or are you 3D printing or how are you doing it? I have seen 3D printed versions. I think I missed someone up there. Hold on. Boy, this live chat will not let me scroll on it. It is being a jerk. 
D Flow Sounds is working on a wooden ring made from wood veneer. Like a ring for your finger? Uh, Bit Green is practicing muscle anatomy with a small figure sculpture. Always a good thing to practice. I need to practice that more. Sorry if I missed anyone up above. I literally cannot scroll up in my window. I don't know if that's a setting I failed to put in or what, but YouTube's being a butt. Nasir is doing it from scratch with PVC. Okay. Are you turning it on a lathe or are you um, using different sizes of PVC and just gluing them together? imagine you could probably do quite a bit with just a Dremel tool. sure if all these see all, all these little bubbles that are forming like where the tip of my thing is I don't know if those are going to pop on their own or if I need to go in and pop them all although it's not the worst thing to have a bunch of little bubblies on this it's already really weird and distorted and like the surface on this has all these little bubble accents. Let's see there. So, yeah, it's not a problem if um, if the sculpture has weird imperfections like that. With that, I just talked myself out of doing a bunch of work. Uh, Deflow Sound says, "Yeah, finger ring. I made a few that have." little golden triforces on them thanks to YouTube tutorials and now I'm experimenting with other designs oh interesting do you have any um, like pictures of them posted online you could throw a link up there I'd like to see those I do tend to collect a lot of triforcey things And he says, that Castle Fantasy House would be pretty cool, though. Mm-hmm. That's my dream. If I ever become a billionaire, I'm totally making an amazing castle house. Because when you're a billionaire and you do crazy things, it's no longer crazy, it's eccentric. At least that's what I hear. Uh, Nasir says, looks amazing after the painting. Remind me of what you used. Um, if you're talking about what I'm doing now, this is Quick Shade. Uh, it's from a company called The Army Painter. Um, and there are some, some ways to make this type of product yourself with, um, ink and, uh, distilled water, flow aid, and matte medium. If you have all those things, you can look it up on YouTube. There's several people who show you how to do it. It's like a thousand times cheaper to mix up your own batch, but... I learned about that after I already bought these, so I'm just using these. Um, the thing you would want to search for is 
making your own wash. This is this process I'm doing now is called a wash. Which seems ironic since I'm making it much dirtier. Onassis is working on a comic book called View from the Top. Okay. You have to tell us more about that. You have a deadline of October 12th. Mm -hmm. Oh man, deadlines and art. So stressful. Not, not like I don't do that every day at work, but, you know, I still feel it. Uh, Brad is saying to de diffle the little sounds. Those rings you're making, were they inspired by the Happy Adam YouTube channel? And Dflow Sounds is saying, Andrew, yeah, it's a fun little project and I think a nice intro to wood woodworking. You just need veneer, an X-Acto knife, some cyanocrylate glue, which I think is just super glue, and a little bronze. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. It sounds cool. Nessie is saying, so does that mean art doesn't pay well? It's kind of sad. Well, depends on the art you're doing, you know. If you're... <laughs> if you're doing a the right kind of art with the uh, and you found the right audience for it you can definitely make money at it if you do commercial art like I do or you make video game art for a company I make good money doing that uh, if you're just like trying to make knickknacks to sell that's a lot harder to make a living at it's very hard to compete with China I about 10 or 12 years ago when I was teaching myself mold making and casting I was doing it because I thought I'd make do lines of figurines and stuff but the amount of time that it takes me to make them I would have had to have charged you know like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars for something that to most people looks like the same thing you can get at Walmart for you know 20 bucks so there's just no viable way to make that work Unless you go into fine art, and then when it, you're in fine art, it's all about knowing the right people, and, and I don't know the right people. And he says, I hope everyone is safe from the chaos we're preparing for Irma in Tampa, Florida. So, ha hard to potentially let go of my work in progress. Yikes. Yeah, hope you're, hope you're good. All, all good down there. I have a lot of friends in Florida. Um, Brad says, yeah, I remember seeing that. He's been quiet recently. I assume you're talking about the Ringmaker guy. Uh, Brecknar says, I'm in Central Florida, and Amy's saying to stay safe, which, you know, I, I guess, like, what else are you going to do? You're going to, like, run out into the middle of the storm? Some people do that. 
So yeah, okay, it's it's totally legitimate to tell people to stay safe, but only if they're idiots. So um, just consider if anyone tells you to stay safe during a hurricane, they're implicitly calling you an idiot. I kid, I kid. Yeah, California is getting a lot of fires, and, like, even up here in Washington, we're getting a bunch of the smoke. There's ash raining down. When I opened my car yesterday morning, a bunch of it blew off the roof of my car onto my seat. And it's been like, just, like, really hazy and orange light. I'm sure nothing compared to what it's like in California, but it's crazy that it has an effect that far away. I think there's fires in, in uh, Oregon and Probably parts of Washington, too, but nothing like those crazy ones sneaking up on Burbank. Amy is asking, what else is she supposed to say as opposed to stay safe? Um, that's a good question. It's kind of like, what do you say when a person sneezes? It's just expected that you say, God bless you, or Gesundheit, and, and why? And then you're rude if you don't say something nonsensical? It's, it's a very strange world we live in, Amy. going to see what happens when I apply some of this onto a rusted piece. So, hmm. So, one of the cool things that the rust does is it makes these little, um, you know, pools of rust, you know, where the, the water is leaking down and corroding the metal. And so I don't want to lose that, but the quick shade, I mean, specifically what it does is it fills in the, the low points. And so it would be filling in those parts if I put it over everywhere, but I might not put it everywhere. Like, I love what's going on in this area here. I'll, like all these little, let's see how close we can get to that detail. Oh, yeah, look at that. What a great camera. Yeah, that's just, that's super cool texture. So I definitely don't want to lose that. Dflo says, you can't post links here, but you tweeted me a pic of the first ring you made. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm disappointed to learn that you cannot post links here. I wonder if that's a setting that I can change. So what happens if I just poke some of this into some of these areas, but not others? Am I going to lose what makes this surface cool? That's the real question.
Ideally, this stuff would drip down on its own, but it's so thick and goopy. It almost looks like uh, kind of dirty motor oil, which is kind of cool. I'm kind of wanting to evoke, like, old, you know, obviously rusty, but just like old broken down stuff. Another background I was looking for was like a wagon wheel. I thought that might be cool to put this on too. I got some super cheesy, hold on a sec. I got this barbed wire, like Halloween prop. Um, I didn't want to get real barbed wire because I don't want to like be endangered every time I move the piece of like getting tetanus. So, <laughs> so this is close enough. Once I put the the real rust paint on it, I think it'll be a lot cooler. But I was gonna put this around it and then a like a bunch of rusty nails or something. Let's see how long this goes. Yeah, I was thinking like some kind of a circular pattern around it. I wonder how this reacts to it. Let that sit for a while. Uh, Bruckner says, try putting spaces here and there in your link. Maybe YouTube filters it out and looks like a link. Oh, right. That is one way to do a workaround. Uh, Christopher is asking what kind of camera am I using so I just got this it's a Logitech uh, what is it it's 922 C9 I, I don't know it's it got all the best reviews from people who stream uh, from from this year so I spared no expense now it's really sad because this camera I think it's 80 or 90 bucks and you know, I was shooting, I've done all my other live streams so far on a $550 DSLR camera. And this one is like, the image is higher quality. I can move the camera around no problem. It's not shutting down. It's just like so much better. Although you, you probably wouldn't want to shoot a, a wedding on this. All right, Bracknar tried posting a link. Let me see what happens when I bring that up. Oh, what? You're not even going to let me copy and paste it? Oh. Okay, sorry. My, I don't know if it's my, if it's Chrome or if it's YouTube, but. I can neither scroll up in the live chat, nor can I copy and paste from the live chat. So, I will work on coming up with a solution to that for next time. Because sharing art is uh, one of the cool things about being on the internet. It's pretty, pretty lame to have an art stream where we can't share our art. Or share our, our glove travails. Uh, Brackner is saying, I don't know if anyone else is seeing this, but on my end, the main camera is lagging a bit, kind of giving me motion sickness. 
Oh, is it like happening consistently? You know what? I actually see it uh, on my end. So it's not just the internet squashing it. There's probably a setting. Let me just look real quick. Uh, configure video. Focus, zoom, exposure, pink, uh, pan, tilt, low light, compensation. No, that's not what I want. Uh, Krista is asking, hey, Josh, what is this project for? You just arrived. Um, it's, I, I was doing a tutorial on mold making. That's going to be coming out soon. And this was one of the things that I cast several copies of. So I'm just playing around with different kind of paint styles for it. Okay, so there's a FPS, and I have the option to match the output FPS, do the highest FPS, lock it at 30, Let's see if that fixes anything. Thirty video format, any blah 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 blah. That's is that still that's still really laggy. Hmm. I'm assuming it's been like this the whole time. Actually, I think I remember seeing it uh, doing this, and I just assumed it was a was an internet problem. But it's clearly not. If if my OBS software is having problems with it, uh, possibly too high quality. Yeah. So I set the resolution like it it can go up to 4K. It says. Um, and so I put it at the just HD, the 1920 by 1080. Uh, let's see if changing that fixes it. Every few seconds I go into bullet time. Yeah, it's just my pace. That's how I work. Uh, let's see. Bitgreen, have you tried opening up your stream as a viewer? I can scroll up and copy text from the chat myself. Um... No, I have not tried that. I am afraid to do that right now. But I will consider that for next time. Uh, Josh, what happened with the portrait sculpture you were working on? I'm still working on it. I ordered some eyeballs for it. And um, I'm hoping that that will um, fix my eye problem. Like, I'm having a lot of problems with the eyes. Okay, I just bumped down the resolution. Am I still having, yeah, still having issues. Okay. How low do we have to go in re resolution? Let's just go down to uh, 800 by 600, just ridiculously small. Okay, it does. So, is it a problem with the power of my computer, or is it a problem with... What would that problem be? Okay, well, well, we'll leave it like this so that people aren't sick. It's less resolution than I'd like, but um, uh, I'll, I'll try to figure it out when we're not live. Chris says, good choice on the Army Painter. I use some of their products for painting Warhammer models. Yeah, well, this was... I mean, for the amount of shade you get, it's way cheaper than the other brand that I like, which is this uh, Citadel shade. Um, I like the Citadel shade a little bit better, but I think this was close to the same price as that. So it's just, can't compete. In the meantime, uh, I got a recipe and that I'm going to be trying for making my own, which will be way, way cheaper than all of those things. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this so far. Hmm. Looks 
looks like I need to move my camera back because of the stupid resolution. Hold on. Uh, Aiden says, what is the extra credit crew like? I know you've done a few analysis series with Dan. Have you met anyone else there? Yeah, I've been, I've been like personal friends with James for many, many years. Um, and we hang out and grab lunch from time to time. He's just as nice as he seems on all the videos. It's like, he's a person who legitimately cares about other people and wants to make the world a better place. And that is awesome. Uh, Dan is also super sweet. Uh, his wife is awesome. I was uh, hanging out at PAX with them last Friday. There was a, an extra credits get together. That was fun. It's always funny at PAX because, no, actually this happens at Game Developer Conference too. Wherever James goes, this like crowd of people, he ends up with like, it, it looks like a, like a group of disciples just following him around. It's pretty funny. Amy says, I looked up your ring, Defo. It looks really good. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. Nassier Feed says, open a viewer, but from another browser. Like if you're streaming from Chrome, go with Firefox. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, do I have Firefox? Ah, uh, and now. <laughs> okay, guys, tell me how to fix this. Ready? This is, this is the worst thing. Hold on. So when I put. When I put my cursor down on this bar, it scrolls my internet without me telling it to scroll. And I can't make it not do that. Why is it doing that? It's, that's so awful. Citadel products are insanely overpriced to say the least, says Krista. Yeah, I mean, Pretty much most art things, Any, anything where there's a niche, you're going to find that um, manufacturers within that niche are ridiculously overpriced for what they do. And I think it comes down to the fact that they're, you know, the people they're selling to are such a smaller group than if they were making a, a broad appealing product, you know, that would just be something that people at Home Depot buy or something where they're selling millions and millions of units constantly as opposed to just uh you know a couple thousand so the the scale the economies of scale helps those manufacturers who make things for huge groups of people <clears throat> uh, andy says the image still looks great but could could be a phone thing like the resolution looks like it's on a phone or the uh, stuttering could be a phone thing. Amy says, James, the accidental celebrity. He's just so distinct looking. Yeah, it's, I mean, he kind of looks like Jesus too. And so that's what makes it extra funny when he's wandering around with disciples in tow. Hmm, still not convinced about this. I started around the top, so if I wanted to, like, make it seem like this was, was water damage from rain or something, I could just kind of taper it off as it goes down, and I think, I think that's what I'm going to do. It, it gives the piece, you know, kind of a, a journey. It variegates as it goes down, which is, which is neat. Uh, Dflow says you could also use incognito mode if you're on Chrome. Uh, what would that accomplish? 
for a stream. Bracknar got all my passwords. Fair. Um, Aiden says, oh man, I would love to stick around, but I have school at 6 a.m., so I really should get to sleep. I agree, school is important. How long have we been going? We're going almost an hour. So, we'll probably be shutting her down soon. Probably when I'm done with this guy. Uh, Brackner says, here's another obtuse workaround for pictures. Change your profile pic temporarily. I have an auto thumbnail and large extension. <laughs> that is indeed an obtuse workaround. <clears throat> 6 a.m. is way too early. I agree, Amy. That's, I mean, science has proven that kids teens, even up to young adults, getting up that early has nothing but negative effects on pretty much everything, on their their attitude, their grades, their um, enthusiasm for school in general. It's just ridiculous that we still do that. I wonder if it's different in other countries. Some, someone tell me, in, in, your, in your country that's not the U.S., do they start school stupidly early? Nasir uh, says, so Josh, what's going on with the novel? Any progress? When can we pre-order? Uh, still working on the art. Uh, just today I was working on the cover art. I was trying to come up with a way to design, because like I said, I have, I think, nine novels at this point, and so I'm trying to come up with a cons consistent visual language uh, for the whole series. And... Um, so I, I like this idea of making like a cameo of the main character in each book. Like, um, uh, is there another, you know, those little brooches that have a figure's head on it. They're usually like Greek figures or like uh, Art Nouveau had a lot of those. There's like a beautiful woman carved into a shell or some other semi-precious stone, but it's like a relief sculpture. And um, so, yeah, my idea was to do each of those characters and then I could get those, I'm sculpting it on the computer, I'll render out a, you know, a beautiful shot for the book cover and then get that 3D printed, not the book, but the sculpture, get that 3D printed, cast that and then I could easily, um, or mold it and then I could easily give, have a bunch of casts for each of the book that I can give away for prizes and um, maybe sell if anyone ever wants to buy those someday. But that's my idea. I'll, I'll see how it looks. I, I still have to make the proof of concept that it actually is as cool as it is in my head. So we'll see. And uh, yeah, I'm still thinking this year. I, I still think we'll have the first book out this year. Good night, Aiden. Thanks for stopping by. Good luck in school tomorrow. Amy says, you don't have a first period this year and you're enjoying it. Nice. Um... Yeah, I'm, honestly, the the thing that I hated about school was getting up early. Like, everything else was fine. Uh, 
Just made me so miserable. Of course, like, I, I have a job now that's got very flexible hours, but I carpool with a guy from Bungie. And um, so I can get up at, like, 9, because both of us get into the office around 10 o'clock. So <laughs> and even that feels uh, like, oh, it's so hard. Last December, I took a staycation. I took the whole month off because I had a whole bunch of vacation days. I took the whole month off and, um, you know, just sat in my garage and did a bunch of art. And what I ended up doing was getting into a schedule where I was up for about 25 to 30 hours straight. And then I would sleep for anywhere between, I'd say, like 14 and 18 hours. And so I got in that in that habit for several weeks. And it was, I mean, it was awesome in one sense, and just getting to do what my body just wanted to do. Um, but it was also very weird in the sense that, you know, I, the schedule with the rest of the family and that kind of stuff was very, it was very odd because I'd be going to bed right when they were waking up or getting home from work or, you know, it's time for dinner and I'm like, time for breakfast. Uh, Krista says, this is the same here in Iceland and the Scandinavian countries as well. Attendance at 8.15ish. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's close to what it is around here. I want to say uh, 7.50 is when my son needs to be at school. Nasser says, when I was in school, I used to wake up at 5.30 a.m. because my school was a bit far from my house. Oh, 5.30. Oh, that makes my stomach hurt just thinking about it. Uh, Nasser says, I would definitely buy your book. Awesome. I'm glad to have one sale. I will, I will make sure to hit you up when it's uh, available and be like, you promised, you swore. Uh, Jonathan said, I had jazz band before school and I always showed up a half hour early for that. Yikes. <laughs> You're clearly a morning person. Uh, Dflo has got a 10 to 6 job at the moment. Nice. I go 10 to 7 because I take an hour for lunch to work out. And Nasir, you can't sleep for more than 8 hours? Your body hurts? Um, yeah, actually that is kind of a thing that happens to me too. I just... I was able to power through it, but I imagine if it was a little bit worse, that would cause problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly rolling. Like, I wake up probably 20 times a night just rolling like a hot dog from one side to the next, to the next, to the next. I, I know some people who say they just, they sleep on their back in that one position all night. And I'm like, you got to be a vampire. That's just weird. Uh, Amy says her school is, is what is eight slash eight thirty five. You're in block schedule, so every day is different. Oh, wow. I guess that keeps you on your toes. Uh, Nasir says, promise to sign the book for you. Okay. I'll sign the book for you.
Um, actually, you know, you could give me some some valuable information. What is your preferred uh, format for books? Do you read ebooks or do you like printed books? If you like ebooks, what uh, device do you slash service do you read them on? I will be doing an audio book. Um, I've got a friend, my same friend I carpool with, who works at Bungie, who has a super awesome baritone voice. And has done some some kind of acting before, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give that a try and see how good he is, um, and make sure my equipment is up to snuff. Like I'm only gonna do it if it sounds professional, but um, yeah, I definitely want to do an audio book. That's how I get most of my books these days. Uh, Bitgreen says, Josh, I didn't realize you had already seen my hand sculpture an hour ago and commented on it. So thanks. I'll keep practicing. Yeah, that was cool. Are you going to do a head? At some point, you're going to have to do a head. But that was a very creative workout. Work workaround to put all the, uh, the mouth and the ear and the eye and everything on a hand. One of my freakiest nightmares I can still remember from when I, I must have been a toddler, um, was uh, I, me and my dad were throwing stuff into a well. I don't know what the stuff was, it was just big heavy objects. And suddenly this hand comes up out of the darkness like a giant hand and it had a screaming mouth on the palm of it. And that's, that's just... Like, I have no idea how that came into my head, but very creepy dream. Uh, Krista is saying, what is your book about, Josh? Uh, it is about, let's see, what is it about? I really should have my elevator pitch down by now. It's hard because aesthetically... It is like a fantasy novel. It's got a hero who goes on a journey, on an adventure, and he's got to get treasure and stuff like that. Um, but that makes it sound like something that it really isn't, because it takes place in a world that I've been designing for 20-plus uh, years now. And one of the huge passions of mine is world designing is world building um, scientifically plausible worlds. So it's not high fantasy. Like there's no fairies and, and uh, floating castles and that kind of stuff. Um, the whole premise is that this planet is inhabited by a bunch of different um, sentient creatures who were basically transplanted there by a super advanced alien race whose goal is to preserve sentience. So they go around the universe finding planets that are about to be destroyed by supernova or incoming asteroid or environmental uh, apocalypse or whatever. And they essentially like scoop up some amount of those inhabitants and their plants and animals and all that kind of stuff. And they find a suitable transplantation planet to stick them on. So. The planet that this story takes place on is called Talifar, and it's home to about a dozen or so of these sentient races. Um, and then they're kind of forced to not kill each other by the aliens that transplanted them there. They basically have a, have a technological ceiling, like no creatures there can invent electricity. Because once you get electricity, then you start doing... So, so basically, the, the aliens have this big system in place that just zaps, you know, with an EMP or something, any electrical sig signal that pops up. So the whole planet and all its people are stuck in a permanent kind of dark ages. Um, but, which makes it sound very sci-fi, but none of that part is, like, explicitly stated. It's just like... 
a cool fantasy world with realistic, plausible creatures uh, interacting in, in interesting ways. Which is a really long way to tell you almost nothing about the actual book. <laughs> Uh, Amy says, I'm a print book person myself. Depending on where, how it's sold, I'll probably pick up a copy. Sounds really cool. I think it's really cool. Uh, now, Sears says, I'm a collector, so I prefer printed books. Also, printed art looks far more awesome than digital. Yeah, um, uh, all the artwork that I've seen in on ebooks looks really bad, but... I think that's because all of the all the uh, devices that I've seen it on are like crappy black and white, like kin old Kindles and stuff like that. I don't know if newer devices show better, higher resolution art or not. But that's something I'll definitely be looking into as we get closer and closer to publishing. But um, yeah, we'll definitely have a print-on-demand version of the book. And it's going to have lots and lots and lots of illustrations. And a very cool cover. Kind of like in this, this kind of oily drip effect. I think that's working. And I am going to, I'm going to taper it down and use it less and less as it goes lower. Jonathan Zilk said, what do you say the book was called? Uh, so the series is called Tales from Talifar. That's kind of the like Star Wars brand, you know what I mean? And then the first book is called uh, The Scarred King. Well, it's a trilogy, so there's going to be The Scarred King 1, uh, Exiled, Scarred King 2, Sojourn, or so we haven't decided on the final names, but it's called the scarred king it's basically about a guy who's forced by a usurping bad guys to go off on this quest and uh and then come back and reclaim the throne Uh, Nasir says, Josh, did you know there's something called hypernova? It's different than supernova. Uh, no, I've never heard of that. Like, a star does a process called hypernova? Or is that just when you drink a Red Bull and watch, uh, watch PBS? Uh, is that even a thing anymore? Nova was the old science show on PBS when I was a kid. I don't even know if it's still around. Andy says, good night. It's been a long two days prepping for Irma and still too much left to do. The piece is looking great. Hope you catch. Hope to catch more of your streams next week. Awesome, Andy. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh, thoughts are with all of you guys down there. and Yeah. Someday we'll have to figure out a way to um, either not build communities where we know that nature is going to destroy it constantly, or we're going to come up with better methods for protecting ourselves and our stuff when the bad weather does happen. That's in my ideal world. Ah, the nefarious nerd. Hello, nefarious nerd. 
Josh, what do you think the timeline for your book will be? When can we expect to see the finished product? Hopefully soon. It sounds badass. This year, I, I hope by the end of the year. And if you follow me at all on any social media or this channel or anything, you will hear me talk about it a lot. So don't worry about missing it. It is my goal is to someday run a company that is just producing work in in this world that I've been developing for 20 years. So, yeah, I will not shut up about it. I mean, well, we'll see. I mean, the first book could come out and just, like, I'll find out from people that it's actually awful, and then it'll be back to the drawing board. So that's always a possibility. In which case, I'll shut up about it for a while until I find a way to make better stories. The, the thing that I'm really interested in is creating a media company that is working from the world up rather than taking a story and then retrofitting a world to fit it. Like the way Star Wars and Marvel and Harry Potter, like all these other expanded universes that are out there, they started with some big media, you know, piece of media, whether it's a movie or a book or comics, whatever, right? And then all of their other media, you know, in, in other uh, art forms are almost always contradicting each other and the main source material and that kind of stuff, um, which is super annoying to me. Like it, it honestly kills a lot of enthusiasm that I, that I would have for a brand. Um, it's probably just me, but I mean, there's probably other people like me that would like totally be excited about a, uh, an IP like the one I'm creating where every story that takes place in it is canon. Like if it's published, it's canon. If it's, whether it's a comic book or a video game or a novel or a movie or te like they're all canon from the beginning. Like they would all, all the scripts would be vetted first. It'd be vetted by, uh, by a lore continuity person and by a group of scientists, I'm going to have a cabal of scientists who pick it apart and say, well, actually, uh, according to physics, Castle can't be those proportions or what, you know what I mean? And I mean, hopefully they're more constructive than just say, no, that's bad. They'd be like, well, if you change this one little thing, it could totally work. That's the idea. Um, yeah, so... That's my big dream. We'll see. First, I got to have one big hit so that other people want to join and make art in that world as well. Because obviously, uh, me and my mom, who's the primary author of my novels, um, we we can't make a world full of content. We can make some some content. Uh, Amy says, yeah, I've seen Nova. Not an age problem, anyway. Yes. Awesome. I'm glad people are still seeing that show. I imagine that's kind of an old staple that they just continue to do forever. Uh, Jonathan Zilk says, I'm from Oregon, and it's on fire at the moment. Yeah, we're breathing all your ashes. Uh, could you do me a favor and stop being on fire? Uh... And apologies if you are actually like worried that your house could burn up. In which case, it's not it's not a joke. Uh, Krista says hypernova is when a star uh, thirty times greater than mass of the sun goes boom. There's a comment from me you missed up there. Some interest showed in your book. Oh, okay. Well, gosh darn it! If there's a way for me to uh, to look at all the comments, um, I will definitely go back and check that out. Or you could just copy and paste it and re-ask it. Maybe I won't be blabbing so much and I can answer you. Uh, Josh, I have an ethical question I'd like to ask you. Okay, Bracknar, fire away. I enjoy ethical conundrums. Uh, Nasir says, supernova are dying stars. They happen all the time. Hypernova are the rare thing in the universe that happens eight times a year in the whole universe. And when it happens, it creates black holes. Okay. I can buy that. Uh, 
uh, there's a there's a podcast and, and YouTube series about world building uh, by a guy named Edgar. What is his name? Can't remember. But it's called Artifexian. And he goes into lots of astronomy and like how planets form and what kind of configuration, you know, star systems can be in and that kind of stuff. It's super fascinating. Speculative maths and astronomy and stuff. Uh, Nasir says, yes, I watch a lot of documentaries. Yep, documentaries are awesome. I have a ton. I also have a ton of uh, lectures, like college courses from the teaching company that I listen to regularly on everything from like geology and biology to philosophy, religion, ethics, psychology. When you're, when you're, serious about making a scientifically plausible world turns out you need to know a lot of stuff oh my gosh it's so much stuff amy says lore continuity person sounds like the greatest nerdiest job that could possibly exist <laughs> yep yep i hope to create that job i mean we do we we have a person at my work, uh, I work on Guild Wars 2, and that's definitely a big part of their job. But we also have a lot of like super fans that came to work with us after Guild Wars 1, and some, some even after Guild Wars 2 came out, that actually know more about the lore than a lot of the writers. And so we're constantly having to make sure that we're vetting our stuff with all the people. I mean, like... Uh, what did that character do, you know, 250 years ago? Leads to some pretty funny debates. Uh, Krista says, Okay, I'm sold on it. I'm currently world building for an RPG game and always interested in other people's work. I'll definitely grab a copy. Excellent. Yeah, world building is super fun to me. I love the challenge of creating internal consistency. Like, even for wacky magical worlds where people are casting fireballs and riding on dragons and stuff, like, you can, you can still totally be internally consistent, and that's the kind of fiction that grabs me the most. Like, I love the, the tone of Harry Potter. It's, it's just so fun and whimsical, but... Man, she's just constantly breaking her own rules and going back and, like, it's frustrating. It's just frustrating to me. Bracknar says, this is an easy one. There's a certain toy line that produces an 18-inch figure with very limited articulation. I decided to buy it, to chop it up, and create a skeleton to vastly improve it. But I thought I could cast the pieces and reproduce this and sell it. This is wrong, right? Bottom line? Or am, am I changing it in a transformative way enough? Oh man, that is, that is a conundrum. Um, I think... Well, my gut reaction is that it comes... It really comes down a lot to the details. Like, uh, how... How much is it being changed? Because... Um... This, this is actually a thing that comes up a lot in, in CG and in, uh, computer sculpting because it's so easy to grab a base mesh of a human, male or female. I mean, there's even like monster base meshes you can get and then you can muck around with it, make changes and sell that. Um, and it's, a, it's also actually a big thing that's been happening on Steam where people take assets from... You know, people who make whatever, you know, boxes and buildings and, and zombies. And they just buy those assets. They stick them on a, in a crappy game. They just throw it all together and they sell it. And it's like, is that ethical? Uh, I mean, technically, it's not breaking the law. That's what assets are, are made for. But, um, 
you know what? I need to go answer the door real quick. I think someone got locked out. One moment. Sorry, I'm streaming. Okay, I'm back. Gosh, I thought I was almost done and I just keep tinkering. I guess that's how things that's how things take so long. It's because I just keep tinkering. Okay, so the ethical conundrum. Yeah, uh like I guess I wouldn't feel bad if I was using that as a skeleton and I did significant like sculpting or changing over it. Like I don't know. I, th I, th I think that's definitely gray area that you just kind of have to suss out and feel like, what are you comfortable with? Like, I tend to err on the side of assuming, like, uh, this is how I answer ethical questions. If, if the person whose material I'm using is, is standing over my shoulder or is my good friend, and I take his idea and then sell it and make money on it, like, how would I feel I'm treating my friend at that point? Um, so yeah, maybe that would help to guide you a little bit. It's hard because you, you never know the attitude or the disposition of the people whose IP you're playing with. Like, I mean, the worst case is like Nintendo, right? Where <laughs> they won't even let you advertise their games for free you know like you have to be some signed up partner and do everything you know it's just it's such a crappy system and it's not like it's the cr actual people creating the games who feel that way it's a legal team who's making these decisions and uh yeah that's, that's why i say it's gray there, there's so many decisions about ip that are driven by people in suits who don't care about art, who don't care about fun. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm, uh, what is the word? Uh, I'm being a bad person by assuming that all of these people in this category are this way, but I've just had a lot of experience with it. That's very frustrating to me. Uh, Nasir says, or oh, Jonathan says, it's just you and me, scary mask face. No, oh, I'm, I don't, this guy? Oh, oh, like when I left. That's probably what you mean. Uh, Josh, any updates on the portrait sculpture you're working on? Yes, I ordered, uh, eyes that I think are the appropriate size and color, uh, because I'm going to be putting glass eyes in there. And when those arrive, I'll, I'll probably do another stream on uh, popping those suckers in. Jonathan, yeah, it looks like a cult mask. Uh, yeah, it does. It's, it's from this piece of art for a band called Demon Hunter, hence the, the title of the thing. One of my favorite bands. Uh, Bracknar says, I'm thinking of adding a bendy wire for the joints and adding in bendy wire for articulating the fingers. Something I don't think anyone else does. Also adding in battle damage weathering. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, man, I, I, I guess I would just say, like, you're in the gray, and the more you change it, the more out of the gray and into the white you're going to get, <laughs> if that makes sense. So... Yeah. Uh, you know, most ethical conundrums come about because you have com two competing values and you're having cognitive dissonance because you think both things are important and you have to ad address what's happening in reality. And, uh, and it can, can get tricky. I, I, I find that it helps to try not to be binary in my thinking where it's just like one you know this decision would be absolutely evil and this decision would be absolutely angelic no it's more like let's let's just try to get as close to being 
good to each other as we can. And, uh, you know, mo most of us aren't going to always succeed at that. But if that's the goal, you're going to end up behaving better than if you're not thinking that way at all. Or if you think that it's only worth doing if you can do it perfectly. That, that should not be the attitude. Krista says, uh, maybe they share Teddy Roosevelt's view on the law. Everything is allowed and less specifically prohibited. <laughs> I didn't know Teddy Roosevelt felt that way, but I could see it. All right, I think I'm starting to get uh, pedantic with the details now. And it's probably not serving the piece as a whole. So I'm going to let this sit. Sometimes, sometimes it's really good. Like even if you think there's more tinkering you could do, just let it sit for a day and come back. And see if you still feel that way. So. My chair is extra squeaky today. It feels, oh, it's because I didn't put on any music. So all the chair sounds and stuff are too loud. Um, guys, remind me next time if I've forgotten to put on music. No wonder it's such a lame party tonight. Uh, think, uh, Brackenar says, thanks for the input. Uh, helps put it in perspective. You're welcome. Uh, good night, D Flow and uh, Dottie Burke. Hey, Dottie. Demon Hunter sounds like a metal band. Have you ever heard of the thrash band Epicenter? Uh, I feel like I've heard of them. I don't think I've actually heard them, though. I'll check them out. I do enjoy the metal. Okay, now I'm going to try some of this strong tone. See if that looks better, worse, or is worth the effort. Uh, Nassir says, the other day I saw someone doing a portrait sculpture and he used a life-size skull, then cover it with clay and started adding details. Is that cheating or is or, uh, it's known in the field? Oh, no, that's, that's totally legit. Um, I mean, especially if you're completely sculpting over it. But, I mean, there are lots of artists, like fine artists, who sell pieces for tens of thousands of dollars that just take, like, taxidermy and, and skulls and stuff like that and, like, glue them together in weird ways and stick gears on them or, like, you know what I mean? There's, there's lots of found object artists out there. Um, I think that's a, that's a little different than taking a sculpture that someone did and... Um, you know, just putting a little twist or two on it and reselling it. Like, found ob... Well... Yeah, actually, the, the found objects, that, that is an interesting... Uh, collage in general. It's a very interesting art form. The You know, the fact that you're taking stuff that other people have made and putting it together in ostensibly unique and profound ways um, and then making money from that yeah I don't know like in my in my gut that just feels kind of weird and wrong but on the other hand it's not a strong enough gut feeling to be able to be like hey you people doing collages you're bad stop it I don't feel that strongly about it I just feel like if I was doing that I wouldn't feel super proud of my work. Yeah, I don't know if this darker is buying me anything or not. I mean, it's highlighting the, the cracks pretty well. 
Yeah, I, I think what I'll do is I'll just leave it like it is, and once I get it mounted on the wood, I'll take another look at it, because, I mean, it's, it's such an easy technique to do. I can do it while it's mounted, no problem. Just do a little more under the extreme edges just to keep the piece the two sides consistent uh, Bracknar says Nasser I wouldn't consider that cheating over much Amy says depends on their purpose I don't think cheating in art exists except cheating yourself out of learning um, so I guess my view is like, you know, I've been working on this world I'm talking about called Tales from Talifar, and say I publish my book, and I've been working on this thing for 20 years, right? I've been working on this world and the ideas in it, and say uh, someone takes one of my creature ideas and just sticks it in their world and like changes the name and changes one or two details about it, like... I, w I, I personally wouldn't be angry, but I would certainly be disappointed <laughs> because almost literally nothing makes me angry. But, um, yeah, I would feel like, can't you, you know, do, do your own thing? Although, here's a really interesting gray area for you. So, been working on this 20 years, right? I've had all these ideas over the years that have since... Like, I came up with the idea 15 years ago, and then five years ago, some movie or game or something comes out, and it's almost identical to my idea. Like, what do I do at that point? Is it, like, I think ethically, I have no problem still using my idea that I came up with. But how is it going to be perceived by people who are paying money for, you know, my products? Are they going to feel like, oh, this guy's a hack who just steals ideas he likes instead, you know, exactly what I was, was referencing before. So that's, that's tricky, especially because one, one of the ideas that I had was um, these polar bear centaur people who um, break off, or they don't break, they, they ride on icebergs, right? Like they stick sails on them or whatever, and sail these icebergs around uh like and then they go go out viking and whatever and then i come to work at arena net and then like literally a year later my art director daniel dolchu makes this concept piece that's polar bear people on a giant iceberg with uh sails on it i was like really really you couldn't have just mm. So what I did in this case is I, I just kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit, like conceptually, it's still very similar. Like I wanted a polar type of um, uh, like ice age sentient creatures um, that ride around on ice. But actually I ended up doing some research. This, this is another place where, where trying to be scientifically plausible actually pays off creatively i think in I, I looked it up and i was like could you actually sail an iceberg around it turns out no you absolutely could not like the the amount of pressure generated by sails compared to the 90 percent of the iceberg that's under the water the weight and everything would not make even the slightest difference so i started looking up different types of ice and there's uh, fast ice which is much thinner chunks of ice you know in the arctic circle that's like stuck on and then there's um oh i can't remember the name of the other it, it's like it when fast ice breaks into chunks they're not like icebergs they don't have 90 percent under the water they're more like floating platforms and so then i posited creatures that can pull it like a chariot so like these giant sea turtle whale things and I still have to run this by some people who know physics and marine biologists and stuff like that. But 
to me, it made it a more interesting thing than it was before. It's more grounded and plausible, and it's different. So, uh, Jonathan Zilk is saying, what Demon Hunter song should I listen to first? Uh, it depends on how hard of music you like. Um, you know, you can't ever go wrong. Just go on YouTube and type Demon Hunter and whatever the first video, that's probably going to be their most popular one. Give that a try. All right. I think this is a good, a good resting point for tonight. Um, I'm guessing I'm probably going to be on, on Saturday. My wife's going to be at Disneyland. I don't feel the need to go to Disneyland as often as she does. So I just stay home and do art and she has fun with her friends. So it works out great. So yeah, probably Saturday or Sunday I'll be on around noon. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Let me let me make sure I got through all the rest of the comments. Um, Amy says, but that's not cheating, that is stealing. That's completely different. As long as a cheat is transparent, it should be fine. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I could make it. I could see how that would be a good distinction to make. Brad says, I feel the same way when I write a song riff and my bandmates tell me it sounds like a song I've never heard before, right? But, oh, that's got to happen all the time in music because, I mean, there's only so many configurations you could put notes in, especially when you're working in 4-4 in a, in a verse, chorus, verse format. Like, you, I don't know how anyone makes original songs anymore, to be honest. Um Nasir says, cheating definitely exists in every, uh, I assume you mean field, including art. Oh, in everything, including art. Yeah. So, if you are profiting off of someone else's hard work, then, yeah, I would consider that cheating. I mean... <laughs> Maybe cheating and stealing is on a spectrum. Like if you get too far into the cheating area, you've now entered the stealing area. <laughs> you can get a slide back and forth in that gray area. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Amy says, if I make a sculpture with a pre-made skull and I told you I sculpted it from scratch, then that would be cheating, I guess. Well, that would be lying. If I, if I paid you money based on the idea that you did it that you made the skull from scratch but like who buys art like that i guess maybe in the fine arts that could be important like so and so made this piece and that's what makes it valuable you know it's like paint dribbled on a canvas so an elephant dribbles paint on a canvas and it's worth you know two hundred dollars and jackson pollock dribbles paint on a canvas and it's worth two hundred thousand dollars and so if I have my elephant do it and I tell you it was Jackson Pollock, that is lying. And I guess it would also be cheating and, and stealing. Yes, ethics is uh, complicated. Hey, uh, Nefarious Nerd, thank you. Good night. Uh, Amy says, thanks for streaming. Good night, everyone. Bitgreen says, good night. And I say good night. And I'm going to see what I can do about scrolling up to find any uh, comments I missed. And I will research for next time how to make sure I can actually see all my comments so that I don't miss stuff. Um, and it looked like the camera worked fine. Um, this resolution is fine. Let me hold something up real quick. Just as a test. You know, that is fine resolution. I should be happy with that. I just, I felt like if it can go 4K and I'm doing half of that, that should be fine, right? Apparently not fine. Okay, yeah. Good night for real, everyone. See you next time.